Hello everyone, welcome back to Backlot Banter. I'm Tanner Dykstra doing a bit of an unconventional June movie review roundup for the films that we missed but were much talked about during the month of June. Um, I'm here today to talk about big movies like Inside Out and then also some smaller releases that I feel are worth the conversation, The Bike Riders and Thelma. Uh, I'll be getting to all these in this review, uh, in this review, and you can see the timestamps down below too. If you want to jump around or you know sort of avoid some spoilers for some things as well, so like this video, subscribe to Backlot Banter if you haven't already. So uh, first of all, I'd like to start off talking about the biggest movie of the month and of the year so far, that being Pixar's Inside Out 2, the much anticipated sequel to the 2015 film, and. This might be my hottest take just to start off this video with, but I'm not really a fan, I would say. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of the first Inside Out either. I think it's good. I think it's solid. I just don't think it's amazing. And I think that Inside Out 2 is a bit of a step down in terms of quality. Now, there are things that I like, but they are sort of equaled out, evened out by things that I don't like in Inside Out 2. So I'll start with the positives. My biggest thing, my biggest positive with Inside Out 2 is the new cast additions. Uh, they are much sort of touted in the marketing materials, those being Anxiety, as portrayed by Maya Hawke, and uh, Envy, as portrayed by Iowa Debris, uh, and then some smaller parts like Ennui by Adele Exarchopoulos and Embarrassment by Paul Walter Hauser. I do think that Iowa Debris and Maya Hawke are the best additions here. I think they get... Uh, they're, they're the two biggest personalities to join the cast, and they get the most play. Most of that going to uh, Anxiety, who is largely the main character of this film, as many people have pointed out. And by far the most interesting part, but that doesn't mean that she is the best served or the best utilized in the plot. I do find the plot to be a bit scatterbrained, a bit all over the place, a little sloppy, could be, could be tightened up for sure. Um... As for the original cast members, you know, joy, sadness, anger, fear, disgust, those folks, again, I think kind of poorly implemented in the plot. I think we're kind of going over a lot of the same plot points with them. I was kind of hoping that we would be building upon the conclusions of the last film, uh, the sort of emotional complexity that was the answer to the questions of that first Inside Out film. But again, I felt like we were retreading ground a little bit, and... To speak on the film sort of wrestling between joy and anxiety as the two biggest emotional factors, I don't think the film comes to a lot of interesting or cogent answers in that department. I mean, there is a moment in the film where Joy outright says, you know, sort of poking fun at the fact as Riley is uh, discovering anxiety, anxiety is taking over that, oh, why don't you just choose to be happy, Put it, sort of poking fun at that sort of common talking point that people who misunderstand anxiety disorders often roll out. But I find that the end of the film, when anxiety sort of is having her own panic attack moment in what is a relatively well done sequence, I felt, that Joy just sort of talks her down and takes over and then Riley calls her forward, um, which I felt just really didn't make sense and wasn't like a... Uh, a complex emotional conclusion to the story. I kind of felt that it was retreading going back to the, oh, why don't you just choose to be happy? I felt like there was something, another path that we could have found where we arrive at some sort of more emotional point. Perhaps the emotions realize that Riley can uh, drive herself, drive her own decisions without them taking over. I'm not really sure. Um, outside of that, uh, I find a lot of the bits to be, uh, be pretty funny. Uh, there is a lot of conversation about the, the, the childhood TV show character that pops up briefly, Bloofy, and then the video game character, the Cloud Strife sort of parody. Those are all fun little bits, and this film is comprised of fun bits, but again, I felt the story was a little bit scatterbrained, could have used some tightening up, and really doesn't fit together like a good, you know, a good a, a good kids film does. A lot of the pieces felt separate from one another. And Riley's story uh, as a sort of like third story unto itself outside of the th events going on in her mind, um, I also felt was quite good. It showed, you know, this, this aging going on quite nicely and, you know, sort of displayed the, uh, the, 
the preteen sort of uh, emotional social complexities that a lot of us have to go through quite nicely. I thought I thought it was that was handled well as well, um, but just didn't come together for me really at the end of things. So for that one, just as a quick score, I'm gonna go like a like a five point eight out of ten. I would say uh, just not the hugest fan of Inside Out Two. The Bike Riders. Now, The Bike Riders is one that I was pretty highly anticipating, kind of felt like a classic kind of film, that some, this movie star, period picture, crime, drama, action-y kind of thing, so I would say that it lived up to my expectations. I think that The Bike Riders is quite good. So you have sort of a, a three-hander here, really, with Tom Hardy, Austin Butler, and Jodie Comer being your, your big stars here, and then filling out the rest of the cast with some people like... Um, Norman Reedus, Boyd Holbrook, and some others who I thought were uh, held their own against the cast. Uh, Michael Shannon being one of them, I think. Uh, outside of that, you know, I think our three lead performances are very good. Um, something that I didn't anticipate is that it effectively forms a kind of mm, a love triangle, you know, in subtext, but really an attention triangle is kind of what it really is between, you know, Austin Butler as this strong, silent-type character, Benny, who Jodie Comer and Tom Hardy are both sort of vying for his attention, vying for his time, pulling them, pulling him in their direction. Tom Hardy wanting him to take over the Chicago Vandals, the bike rider club that is uh, the subject of the film, and then Jodie Comer wanting him to maybe not take that role, you know, be, be a, a husband to her, actually. Um, so the the emotion the emotional stakes of that I think are, are quite well done, especially given the performances here. I think this is one of the better Tom Hardy performances I've ever seen. He has a lot of subtlety all wrapped up in this character of Johnny, who is a family man. He's a suburban Chicago truck driver who has a family, has two daughters and a wife, and starts this biker gang as a way to find community and sort of discover something about himself, perhaps. Um, and it really gets out of hand for him as things take a turn for the worse. The gang sort of starts to devolve into crime uh, as the 60s go on and as the counterculture begins to shift after the Vietnam War. I think this film is in conversation with a lot of those historical events and, you know, the uh, Americana and American mythology of that time. I think Jeff Nichols, as the director and, uh, and writer here, really understands a lot of the themes that he's going for. Um, it is it is told in a sort of uh, segmented, sort of disconnected manner. It's sort of framed around this interview being done by Mike Feist. Actually, you might recognize him from Challengers with Jodie Comer. So a lot of the timeline can get a bit jumbled, I would say. But the through line, the emotional character through line is strong. And there's just a lot of cool imagery here. It's cool to see Austin Butler riding down the highway with the wind in his hair. It's a good time. It's a really good time. Uh, a lot of the ensemble cast that I had mentioned already uh, do, do a good job. Uh, Michael Shannon, I think, particularly, has a really good scene where they're sitting around this campfire and he's recounting how he was rejected from the Vietnam War draft. That I really think wraps up the film's thesis about why these guys are joining this biker club. I think it wraps it up quite, ni quite nicely. And there's a couple of scenes like that where you kind of really understand what Jeff Nichols is going for here in this film. So overall, really like The Bike Riders. I'm going to give that one a 7.4 out of 10. And finally, the film I've seen most recently, the film that you're least likely to have seen or maybe even heard of, uh, which is a film called Thelma. Uh, this film stars June Squibb, who has been really a sort of character actor, uh, really known for her old woman roles. She is 93 years old, I want to say, and really breathes some life into what is a small-scale adventure romp. Uh, this film follows an old woman who is taken advantage by a call scammer pose, uh, pretending to be her grandson who scams her out of $10,000, and she decides to prove her independence. She is going to get that money back. And she teams up with uh, Richard Roundtree's character, who's a really fun addition to the cast here. And they, they go out across Los Angeles on an electric motorized scooter to try and find these people and get her money back. And it's a lot of fun. There's some really funny jokes here. Uh, the cast is well balanced out. The time is balanced out between her, 
her, June Squibb, her character Thelma, and her grandson, uh, who I believe is played by Fred Heisinger. He has a really good story, too, that sort of parallels Thelma's story about independence and coming into your own. And also, with independence, you know, not being too independent, not being too proud to ask for help, uh, which is a really important theme of this film. And, yeah, just really, really funny, lots of heart to this, some great emotional moments. I saw this one in a pretty packed theater, actually. This is taking on sort of a life of its own, getting some pretty good word of mouth. I think this is the best-performing film for Magnolia Pictures, which is the sort of small studio behind this one, and it really feels like that, that indie film that could. It's got a lot of heart to it. I don't want to say too much about it because I feel like I could be spoiling or ruining a lot of the moments, but if you can catch this one in a theater near you, I would highly recommend it, but it's perfectly, it's perfectly well one that you can watch with your family, you know, it's a really good sort of family sit with your grandma as well, I think would be really cool, um, I think this is one that people of all ages can get something out of, and I think the filmmakers really go out of their way to make sure of that, that the lessons here can be sort of accessible to anyone. Um, yeah, I, 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 like I said, June Squibb is really great in this. Quite funny, great jokes. There's one joke that is kind of my favorite where uh, her grandson is walking through a nursing home. He says, calling out for her, trying to find her grandma, and then a bunch of people from a bunch of different rooms answer him. And it's, it's really kind of cute. It's very fun, lots of heart to that one. So, would recommend Thelma as well. I'm going to go ahead and give Thelma a, a 7.1 out of 10. Good fun with that one. So, there is your June movie review roundup for uh, the movies that we missed, uh, some things that I just wanted to talk about there, and we will be uh, continuing to keep up more uh, up to date with the films coming out soon, things like Kinds of Kindness, uh, Quiet Place Part 1, Horizon Chapter 1, uh, we'll be doing reviews for all of those, so make sure to stay tuned, and thank you for watching.